Hello, and welcome to episode 12 of Inside the Nudge Unit. I'm Liz Costa, Managing Director of the UK arm of the Behavioural Insights team, also known as the Nudge Unit. In this podcast, we'll take a closer look at the enormous variety of work the team does all around the world. BIT is a social purpose company, which means that we use our understanding of human behaviour to develop and test solutions to pressing social issues for people and communities. In this episode, we'll be looking at online fraud, conflict resolution in Nigeria, and synthetic data. But first, I caught up with my US colleague, Maximilian, to learn more about a project in San Francisco looking at how changes to the designs of road junctions can have a significant impact in reducing injuries and deaths from traffic accidents. In 2017, traffic deaths hit a 25-year high of 40,000 fatalities. 6,000 of those killed were pedestrians. Cities across the country are trying to reduce traffic fatalities with safety campaigns. And one of the keys to the whole problem might be a flawed mid-century design philosophy. I'm here today with Maximilian Cronadale from our New York office. Welcome to Inside the Nudge Unit, Maximilian. Thank you, Liz. It's a pleasure to be here. We're here to talk about a project you worked on with the San Francisco Metropolitan Transit Authority to improve road safety, specifically to cut pedestrian injuries. Can you tell us a bit more about the project and also how it came about? Our work started with the San Francisco Metropolitan Transit Authority, or you can we can call them the the SFMTA for short, back in in June 2018. And I think for for context here, road related kind of crashes and and uh, pedestrian injuries and deaths have actually been on the rise in the past decade. So I think in the U.S. for motor vehicle deaths, we're now hovering around 38,000 per year. It's very shocking. Um, like to put that into context, in the total number of U.S. casualties in, uh, in the war in Afghanistan and Iraq uh, overall was just over 7,000. So we're talking about a number that's, that's five times that size on an annual basis. So it, it is substantial, right? And what's behind that trend? We're not exactly sure, but we've seen that kind of number rise and fall over U.S. history a little bit, and now it's on an incline. But um, we think that there's a number of factors playing a role. Distracted driving is one of them. So using, um, you know, smartphone, we also notice that um, potentially infrastructure that's built to maximize speed, uh, larger cars, these are all um, playing, we think, a contributing role in this. We also saw kind of a recent spike uh, in, during COVID, actually, um, even though cars were, were driving less, it seems that um, there's been more injuries and deaths in recent years. So that, that's kind of the national context, if you like. And then for this particular project um, with uh, the SFMTA, they've also been noticing an increase in kind of pedestrian deaths um, and injuries. And so for our project, we wanted to focus on that kind of pedestrian side. How can we protect um, cyclists? Uh, and, and folks just kind of crossing the road on a day-to-day basis. And can you tell us a bit more about the behavioural issues at play in those road accidents, and particularly the behavioural issues for the drivers? So we focused on um, kind of the driver behaviour because most of the kind of pedestrian collisions tend to cite the driver as the one that's at fault in these situations. So that was the focus there. And then in order to, to narrow this down, so we had kind of a, a tackleable problem for this project, uh, we just decided to focus on uh, vehicles making left-hand turns rather than right-hand turns, um, because there's some there's some data suggesting that, um, showing that from 2019 in, in San Francisco, that left turns tend to be a lot more lethal and cause more serious injuries than right turns or going straight, which is kind of interesting. The, the behavioral aspect, we did some kind of what we call explore phase research. And this means some of my colleagues went on the ground in San Francisco and, you know, interviewed drivers, interviewed stakeholders, also did observations. So, you know, literally sitting on the corner of the street, watching cars make turns and seeing where does their eye go? Do they focus on the medians? Are they looking at their phones? Are they paying attention to oncoming traffic instead of the the crosswalk? Um, And so... Uh, those are all ways in which we wanted to study the kind of driver's uh, aspect of this, again, the, the behavioral aspect of this. And what we noticed is that, that there's eight different driving unsafe behaviors 
that contribute to um, making kind of unsafe left turns. Four lane roads have quite a few conflict points. Those are places where accidents could happen. These are merging accidents, left turn lane crashes, and rear ends. Just to give you a couple of those, one of those is called cutting the corner. And let me kind of first articulate what would a, a good left hand turn be. It's kind of driving into the, you know, being very careful of pedestrians, paying attention to the light signaling, and making a really like a 90 degree turn before entering the the crosswalk on the, the road that you're trying to enter uh, from a per- perpendicular angle. That would be ideal. What more often happens is that people will, they will kind of make a shortcut and they'll basically um, turn at less of a severe angle. And this means they can maintain their speed. Driving is a really complicated behavior. And so in complicated behaviors, humans tend to rely on rules of thumb. Uh, another example of a rule of thumb is kind of uh, following the call, car in front of you. We call it, we did nickname follow the leader, right? This is a type of kind of herding behavior where rather than having to, comp- uh, to pay attention to the, all the complexity that I just explained about whether there's pedestrians crossing and the lights and all that, you just do whatever the car in front of you is doing. And that's great if the car in front of you is driving well, but if it's not driving well, then you're making the same mistakes that they are. And how did you synthesize the observations and um, and the underlying research into some concrete interventions to test? I think from these kinds of observations and interviews, we realized that we really wanted to focus on um, nudging behavior in the moment while drivers are in the car and driving, as opposed to, for instance, kind of, you know, billboard focused like awareness campaigns or information ca- campaigns, which could focus on like driver technique or a more economic oriented approach, which would be like maybe incentivizing or raising the penalties for crashes. Those kinds of things rely on people to process this information. And we hope that it will therefore then um, impact the calculus in their decision making. We decided to focus on architectural changes to the road because we know that you know whether a driver remembers the awareness and campaign information or not, remembers the penalties and the fines or not, everyone's going to feel a speed bump, distracted or not. So that's the reasoning for for picking that type of intervention that was really based on that research. This is where the sleeping policeman comes into play. Speed bumps, speed humps, and speed tables are all examples of vertical deflection. And what did you decide to do? How did you change the environment? Yeah, so we, we tested uh, essentially two different types of um, road installations, we can call them. The first of those will, can be nicknamed um, enhanced center lines. So essentially, imagine kind of a two-way to a two-way intersection. We added some waist-high, they're called uh, delineator posts. And these are kind of like, you know, somewhat flexible, like neon yellow or white posts uh, with reflectors on them that stick up. And that kind of Uh, denotes where the median is. And then at the end of that, if you can imagine kind of parallel, there's some speed bumps extending that median into the road a little bit so that if you turn too early, you'll get tactile feedback from it. So that that was one. And then on the kind of one-way to one-way intersections, we tried uh, what's sometimes called a cushioned corner or like a painted safety zone. And that's basically, um, if you imagine there's like a cuttable part, like the part that you might be inclined to cut if you're going too fast, We used basically paint to show where that area is and um, place speed bumps and these delineator posts in sort of an L shape to signal that like, hey, don't cut too early. Um, And if you do, you're going to feel it. You're going to see it. um, And you might even hear it, right, if you run into one of these posts. Why did you decide uh, to go down the road of, (laughs) literally down the road Mm -hmm. of um, tactile feedback rather than visual feedback? So for example, playing around with the colors or the prominence of the lines. So I actually think that both are really important, right? Like uh, making sure that these things are visible at, you know, at night, for example, we want to think about what's the the best way that we can make this stuff salient, right? So um, salient just meaning like, how do we make it top of mind essentially? Um, And so the paint was used for that purpose. I think there's probably more experimentation you could do there, actually, trying out different colors. There's ways to uh, tweak what we've done. And crash reduction is a major benefit that planners can achieve with just a bit of paint. But the, the auditory stuff, I mean, that's, you know, in the, in the tactile stuff, I mean, I think that's important in an age of distracted driving, right? Like whether you're distracted fully looking at your phone, right? Or, or maybe you're just kind of cognitively distracted. You're, you're, you're looking at the road, but your mind is elsewhere because you're talking to someone through your AirPods. Like those are both forms of being distracted. And I think tactile feedback can, can kind of snap you out of it a little bit. And the big question, 
did it work? And how did you measure whether it worked? I'm pleased to say that um, it did work. Uh, but first of all, I'll back up and say, you know, we weren't able to measure pedestrian collisions uh, directly, um, even though these are inclining and even though roughly 30, 30 people die every year in San Francisco from this type of injury, they're still thankfully rare. And so we didn't use those as the outcome measure. We used speed. And speed is a, is a good way of kind of, um, it's, a, it's an alternative measure of signaling safety, basically. So we truly had people out there um, sitting at the curb with speed guns, recording the speeds of cars as they make left turns. This is the glamorous life of a BIT researcher. Absolutely. Um, this is the fun part. And that's how we recorded the, the speeds of vehicles making turns, about 2,500 vehicles. We had both treatment intersections. These are the ones that got the installation. And then some control intersections where um, they didn't get installation and we had people recording speeds at both. And then in addition to that, we recorded speeds at three different points in time. So kind of before any installation in spring of 2020, I believe. And then after the installations in fall of 2020, and then again in spring of 2021. So three different periods. What we found is that we were able to reduce vehicle speeds by about 1.7 miles per hour on average, um, which is quite substantial. It's about a 17% reduction if you consider that cars are were only to begin with moving roughly 10 miles per hour. Um, and it seems kind of like visually that that is uh, driven mostly by um, kind of faster cars slowing down their speeds a little bit. There's a kind of overall shift, but we also are a little bit more concerned about the cars that are driving more than 15 miles an hour. And it seems like this intervention had a dis disproportionate effect on them, which is really exciting to see. And while a difference may seem modest, it can make an auto accident much less deadly. That is really exciting. And, and you'd hope that that does translate to fewer fewer deaths and injuries as well, particularly from those faster cars. Um it's a fantastic result. I'm interested in the cost of it. So one of the, the enduring attractions of behavioural interventions is that they're low cost and the cost benefit ratio uh, is very compelling. Do you think that's still the case um, in, in this situation where you were installing physical measures? Um, what was the cost benefit ratio? The SFMTA was in a position to make these investments due to a grant. I can tell you that they are planning on scaling this up because they have seen the impact of the work and they wouldn't have done this if they didn't feel that the cost benefit was there. One interesting side note though, is that they're, they're planning on scaling the speed bumps, but they may not be sc scaling the, uh, the delineator posts because those were actually kind of run over a lot and they, they, they took some damage. <laughs> um, and the rubber speed bumps are a lot harder to destroy. So I think that there is, you know, another reason to kind of test this stuff, pilot test these, is to, to discover which, which components may be more cost effective than others. But the, the speed bumps were absolutely cost effective. That's really interesting and, and very you know, encouraging as well. Do you think that there's potential for this to be scaled, not just in San Francisco, but in other cities around the US and indeed around the world where right-hand turns cause similar challenges for pedestrians and cyclists. When we were working with SFMTA, we paid close attention to the studies that were being done in Portland and New York. Our study was the first that I've seen, actually, that was a kind of causal study showing that this really reduced effects causally rather than just correlationally. And so I think that a lot of other cities are going to be paying close attention to this study and, and see if they can um, replicate this in their own cities. And I, I don't see why why this couldn't work elsewhere. There are going to be relevant cultural differences in how people drive. I mean, think about how folks drive in India versus in the U.S. versus, uh, you know, in, in places where people are driving on the left-hand side of the road instead of the right. Um, but since we base this kind of on, you know, a behavioral examination, I think that, that that same approach and a lot of the same interventions will be successful elsewhere. I think the last thing I'll say is that what we're really calling for here is a kind of focus on the environment, right? Like, and while there is absolutely a place for information and training and all these things, and we do many of these things, it's important to not forget that we can shift environmental behavior and that there's still room to, to save more lives that way. Absolutely. And I hope it is evidence, you know, that gains traction around the US and around the world. And, and also that there's future studies that can get at... Um, the impact on 
on fatalities as well, as well as driver speed. I love this project because it's a change to the physical environment rather than a change to information or processes. And I think it's an inspiration for all of the applied behavioral scientists around the world. So Maximilian, thank you so much for coming on Inside the Nudge Unit to tell us about it. Thank you for having me, Liz. If when I mentioned synthetic data in the introduction, you wondered what on earth that was, you're probably not alone. The concept has been around in research and data circles for a while now, but it's only over the past few years that it's really come into the mainstream. And that's happened as the volume of data being generated has increased exponentially and the computing power needed to really work with that data has been developed. And as we develop a deeper appreciation of the importance of data privacy and protection, researchers are exploring really interesting applications for synthetic data. My colleague Ashlyn Coakley spoke to Dr. Paul Callcraft, our head of data science and technology, about how he and his team are using synthetic data, but most importantly, what it is and why does it matter. Today's topic is synthetic data, something that's new to me uh, I don't know much about, so I think we're going to all learn together. We're very pleased to welcome our colleague, Dr. Paul Calcraft, to Inside the Nudge Unit. Welcome, Paul, and thanks for being on the show. Thanks so much for having me. So we're here to talk about synthetic data, and I believe this is something that's quite close to your heart, Paul. You've talked about it on the BIT website and um, in a recent blog. So let's bring it back to the beginning. What is synthetic data? I'd never heard of it um, until I read your blog, and I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one. So yeah, give us a kind of synthetic data for dummies rundown. So Ashley, I think you are the only one, but I'll do an explanation anyway. The basic idea behind synthetic data is taking a data set that already exists and sort of smudging it so that it doesn't uh, any longer contain sort of personal information. And the way we do that is by looking at a data set and trying to understand what it contains, how does it feel, how does it look, what are the kind of the general properties of it. But then, you know, I won't focus too much on like the actual name that's in there or, you know, the actual number attached to someone's, you know, um, ID number or, or that kind of thing. And instead, we'll just sort of recreate a data set that's very similar, but only sort of taking the general patterns, but removing all of the specifics. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. But let's try ground this in some examples. So on the BIT blog, you used an example of the correlation between an athlete's height and weight. Can you describe how a synthetic data set would be different to the original data set when it comes to these two variables. Right. So yeah, if you've got this, if you've got this big data set of, you know, every Olympic athlete in the 2016 Olympics, for example, and you have their weight and their height all sort of listed out along with their name, that's kind of the original data set would have all that information against someone's name, Usain Bolt, you would have his height and his weight. Whereas in a synthetic data set, you would have two types actually of synthetic data sets that you can build. So they can be high fidelity or low fidelity. And in the high fidelity example, what you want to do is try to recreate as much of the patterns as you can from the original data set. And so that means in the Olympic case, you would notice that actually height and weight have a correlation of about 60%. As someone gets taller, they tend to get heavier. And so in your data set that you recreate, your high fidelity synthetic data set, you would be building sort of random numbers that are for their height and their weight, but they'd be approximately sort of plausible. You know, no one's going to have a height of a one kilometer, for example. And along with that, they would be they would be correlated with weight. So the the type of um, you know you generate a height if it's a tall height, they will also tend to have a heavy weight. But then critically, like the, you won't have their individual names um, because they they aren't they don't correspond to any individual because they've just they've just been too randomly chosen values for height. You can get a much higher usefulness in your data for the same level of, of, of privacy. So it's that optimal trade-off between uh, privacy and utility that synthetic data excels at. 
So the relationships between the variables are maintained with high fidelity data. So what's the difference between high fidelity synthetic data and low fidelity synthetic data? So with low fidelity, we try to essentially destroy all those relationships. So height is no longer correlated with weight. And actually, all you know is that the data set contains a height variable and the data set contains a weight variable. And the benefit of that is that, well, first of all, you're just much less likely to disclose anything that might be sensitive. So the data set becomes much safer to share. But secondly, it's still actually really useful for uh, someone who's doing research to understand exactly how the data set looks and feels. And so with these random numbers that, you know, don't actually co correspond to any individual and are, are sort of safe to disclose, you can nevertheless understand what that data set looks like. And as an analyst, that's just incredibly helpful. Um, and it can stop you, you know, pursuing really sort of long, complicated governance procedures that actually might end up to be completely unnecessary because once you get the data, you realize, oh, it didn't contain the thing that I thought it should anyway. Like, why do we need synthetic data? Don't we have enough data? So that actually takes me to my next question, which is, why is this such a big deal? Why does synthetic data matter? And does it go about solving some of the problems that occur when using normal data sets? So the way that the kind of problem that we have with using normal data sets is that, um, you know, it, it takes a long time, it should take a long time to get sign off and permission to use it because in many cases it's individual level data. So there's, there's information about every individual that's, that's relevant there. And that's, that's sensitive. People don't want their information sort of shared freely and without, without restriction. And so, the real data is absolutely necessary. Like we, it needs to be individual level for us to find out useful things, to us, for us to do proper analysis where we account for different groups and, um, you know, pr precisely how is this policy affecting people? For example, that individual level information is really important, but it comes with a lot of essentially red tape, but in an appropriate manner. But what we want to do is, is make it so that you can actually find out lots more about the data before going through all of that red tape. So that you only go through the red tape when you need to, because there's a lot of time spent in government on these ethical processes, these um, these legal processes too. And it's sort of frightening how often it, it turns out that none of it was, was actually needed. So it's kind of closing down that time between when you come up with a research question and you have a problem that you want to solve and you find out that you need a particular data set, but you know it's going to take several applications, maybe a couple of weeks or sometimes months to actually get your hands on that data set. So instead, you're like, let me have some synthetic data where I can actually have a look at the variables and see if they're even relevant to my research question. Exactly. And it's, it's very often months, you know, two to, two to six months, not, not weeks. Um, and, you know, as well as that, it's also, if, if you just get a general understanding of what data is available around, so, so one thing we want to do is, is actually build a repository eventually of, of this sort of synthetic data across government where you know researchers can actually browse and, and see what's what's available where that's actually going to enable us to think of better research questions and identify where you know problems that we have how can we actually solve those with good data at the moment that's a really strenuous process you have to go go around asking lots of people hey what do you what do you have and how easy is it to use that's a lot of questions that you know often those data holders don't have time to answer as well there's a lot of benefits, we think, on, on sort of every side of the equation. And particularly when it comes to government departments and publicly funded organisations, does it help reduce a bit of the risk for them? You know, government departments are very risk averse, particularly when it comes to sharing personal information or private data. So does synthetic data basically help them get over this kind of nervousness um, when sharing 
information for research organizations? Yeah, so I think it'll help people share the kind of the lower level information, sort of basic information about a data set much more freely. Um, and it will actually free them up to spend their sort of governance and, and sort of and general sort of ethical consideration time on those data sets that we really know need to be used and have a, a really clear research objective because you know that actually the research team has already seen the synthetic data they know exactly how they're going to analyze it they've told you even maybe they've even sent you their code um, so everything can be sort of much more upfront and that allows the time for the ethics and the consideration to go to the projects that that need it most the ones that will that are actually sort of validated and that you know will will create a real result. Can you give us some examples of how you've been using synthetic data at BIT and where you think this methodology has the most potential? So a lot of the work that we've done so far, because uh, this work was funded by Administrative Data Research UK, who are who have a, a sort of general remit to improve the use of administrative data across government, to sort of improve policy, improve research. One thing that they are very passionate about, and that um, particularly at, at BIT, uh, we care about a lot too, is linked data. So uh, linked data is where you are basically taking multiple different data sets from different contexts and putting them together to find out something uh, that you couldn't find when they were separate. An example here is that for example, the Education Endowment Fund have funded many, many trials in education. Uh, so, for example, certain text message programs. Can you can you use text messages to improve attendance at, at college? But you know, actually, some of some of these results are very successful. Some of them are not. But we we don't test at the time um, that we're doing it. Oh, actually, might there have been sort of positive spillover effects on other areas of people's lives? And so what ADR UK, uh, Administrative Data Research UK, are doing with us now is looking at education trials and seeing, was there a positive benefit on, for example, admittance into children's social care? So maybe, um, maybe the intervention that was, that was aimed at improving attendance or, or reducing withdrawal actually had this benefit that no one saw before of reducing the number of incidents in children, ch children's social care. And so by linking the data together, you can find that out. And that's, that's obviously a really impactful finding if you do find that. And so synthetic data helps you build those kind of bridges. These are data sets that live in completely different silos and it's very different people that are, that are used to working with those two data sets. And so by basically sharing synthetic data in both directions, it allows both sides to get familiar and understand how they're going to link that. My sense is the winners and losers in this space will be the ones who really understand how to uh, engage their data, their experience, and then turn that into behavior change. This might be a bit of a silly question, Paul, but where is the behavioral science in all this? And how are you applying behavioral science to the use of synthetic data? And in this case, you know, making it easy was a technological solution. And it's, that's definitely not always the case. And we are, we're sort of quite careful to only apply technology where we think it's going to make a big impact. And it's not just, uh, oh, like, let's, let's throw technology at the problem because everyone's making an app. This really looked like a, an example where a new development or a new approach could, uh, could really sort of shift the dial. So what should an organization do that wants to be data-driven and customer-centric? And the answer to this question is, use synthetic data. And how open have you found BIT's partners, whether they be uh, government-based or private organizations, to the idea of actually using synthetic data? Yeah, it's really interesting to see, actually, there's, there's quite a lot of variation across the board. What we found, particularly around high fidelity synthetic data is that there are some there are some individuals and some departments that are like this is brilliant everyone should be doing this we're sort of fully convinced that the privacy is guaranteed and, and is safe all the way off to there's no way in hell we will ever <laughs> produce synthetic data of this nature because either we don't believe the 
the privacy guarantees of the technology. And it, it is true that that is still up for debate. Or there is a legitimate concern, too, that people might misunderstand what synthetic data is. You know, if you have this high fidelity synthetic data out in the wild, people might mistake it for the real data and think either think there's been a leak or um, or even, you know, look at this data and, and do some analysis on it that perhaps it's not uh, safe for or not, not sort of prepared for. And then, you know, going out and saying, look, look what we found. We found this um, incredible result only, to, you know, to then have quite a challenging PR situation where you're saying, actually, that data isn't real. So, so th th those are some of the very real concerns that, that we saw coming across. But l luckily, what we did see is that most of those challenges and concerns disappear when you start talking about low fidelity synthetic data. And so that's really why why we're advocating for it so hard is because we think a lot of the conversations around synthetic data in government and, you know, believe it or not, there actually are some, are really getting caught up on this high fidelity risk. And so we just think there are people that are overlooking the, the benefits of just this really simple, low fidelity, safe stuff. Great. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Paul. It's been super interesting and I've definitely learned uh, a thing or two from speaking to you today. So I hope our listeners have too. And uh, we hope to have you back on the show in future. Thanks very much. Lovely. Thanks so much, Ashley. Dr. Paul Calcraft there introducing us to the world of synthetic data. We think you'll hear much more about this over the coming years. Conflict is a behavioural and social expression of our shared human psychology. It reveals our propensity to groupishness, to prefer people like us over others, to dehumanise those who are different and to behave in harmful ways as part of deeply ingrained patterns of thinking and acting. In 2018, the Behavioural Insights team joined a consortium of organisations in Smart Peace, an initiative funded by the UK government to develop new ways to foster and support peace building. The program has run in a number of countries plagued by violent insurrections and terrorism, including Myanmar, the Central African Republic and Nigeria. And in particular, it has looked at the role of mass media. In Nigeria, Boko Haram has been terrorising people in the northeast of the country for nearly 20 years now, carrying out countless atrocities and acts of extreme violence. While Boko Haram is still very much active, over the years a considerable number of its fighters, including those who first became combatants when they were still children, have turned away from the group and accepted responsibilities for their crimes. But what happens next? Can former fighters ever be reintegrated back into the communities they attacked so brutally? This was the focus of Smart Peace in Nigeria. And in an upcoming short film, we will be telling the story about BIT and Smart Peace's work there. For the film, Dr. Antonio Silva, our Head of Integration and Social Cohesion, speaks about this work. The film's still being edited, but in the meantime, here's a clip of Antonio talking about this remarkable project. A key lesson that we learned from this evaluation is that mass media and radio in particular can be a very effective channel in shifting people's beliefs and attitudes. We decided that in order to make radio more effective in changing people's attitudes and behaviours. We identified two key aspects that um, would allow us to design better programmes. One was to make content more engaging and more fun. Often the message takes precedence over whether the content is engaging or not. And that leads to people not watching or not listening to these shows, and that makes that the message is lost. And so we think it's really important for professional scriptwriters to be involved in creating an, an attractive narrative that brings people in, and that way the message is delivered and, and is effective. The second aspect is that a lot of content, while based in a local context and with local knowledge, which is crucial in designing uh, effective programs, 
often lacks a strong evidence base based on research to um, change attitudes or behaviours. In order to make the content more engaging, we decided to create short-form content, so no more than two, three minutes, which had previously been shown to be if, as, if not more, effective than long-form content. And we decided to use research based on the concepts of empathy, uh, concepts of messenger effects, to create the most effective interventions. And so we um, interviewed several uh, ex-combatants from the Society of Boko Haram, and we interviewed several community members that lived in regions where um, ex-combatants lived. And we designed these interviews to elicit authentic responses and provide the authentic voices of people that were directly affected by this conflict. So we could construct, based on, on those authentic experiences, testimonials and radio ads that would attempt to shift some of these attitudes and behaviours towards the reintegration of people formerly associated with Boko Haram. We created two to three minute radio ads with the testimonials from real people directly affected by the conflict. And we created three different ads. One ad simply provided information about the real reintegration process that happens in Nigeria, particularly talking about Operation Safe Corridor, which is a government-led initiative to reintegrate people formerly associated with Boko Haram. And then we created two uh, radio ads based on the testimonials of people directly affected to the conflict. One included the voices of ex-combatants explaining themselves why they joined, why they decided to leave, and providing context and understanding to their situation. The third included voices from community members and leaders who lived in areas where ex-combatants lived, providing their own views and opinions about the conflict and about reintegration. So with the testimonials from the community members, one of the things that we tried to do was to use the concept of social norms to shift attitudes. So this, this concept is based on the idea that people tend to behave in a way that is similar to what other people are doing. And the more people do it, the more likely it is that other people will adopt that behavior. And so in this case, what we wanted to highlight was that a lot of normal people that live in these communities are willing to reintegrate ex-combatants, despite them themselves having, for example, suffered a lot in the conflict, but that they're now willing to forgive and to help these communities heal. And by highlighting that normative behavior, we would hope that people listening to this ads would also think again about helping and supporting the reintegration. In the testimonials from the ex-combatants, we tried to highlight the difficult and challenging context a lot of them uh, found themselves. Sometimes they were forced to fight for Boko Haram. It wasn't their own choice. We also highlighted the repentance that most of these ex-combatants felt and that they were fully understood their actions and the consequences of their actions and are willing they were to atone and are willing they were to make amends to these communities and be productive and, and caring members of this community. Once we constructed this, this testimonials with the voices of community members and ex-combatants, we then um, recorded them using voice actors and created two to three minutes that we intend to then broadcast them on the radio. In order to know whether these testimonials were effective in um, changing attitudes and behaviours, we ran a large-scaled uh, randomised control trial in Abuja, the capital, an urban area, in Maiduguri, which is the, one of the main cities of the northeast Nigeria, where most of the conflict happens. And we did a door-to-door -door survey with about 2,500 people, where we asked a series of questions uh, in relation to their attitudes towards the reintegration. And before we asked these questions, we asked people to listen 
to this radio ads. And some people listen to a radio ad unrelated to the conflict. And then we had three other groups. Some people listened to the radio ad that we designed with more information about the reintegration. And then we asked other people listen to the audio clip with the testimonial from ex-combatants. And then finally, the last group listened to the audio clip with the testimonials from community members. And what we wanted to do was uh, to test whether um, different messengers, in this case, community members or combatants or a neutral voice in the case of the information audio clip were more effective in changing attitudes and behaviors related to reintegration and so we compared these four groups of people which were in most characteristics similar in order to measure the impact of these different approaches so from this evaluation what we found was that all three audio clips were very effective in changing people's attitudes towards the reintegration of people formerly associated with Boko Haram. So what we found was that the three audio clips were effective on improving uh, people's support and willingness to reintegrate ex-combatants. But the two most effective audio clips were the testimonials, in particular the testimonial based on the voice of the ex-combatants, which was also effective in changing people's belief that ex-combatants could change, so their ability to change, and also uh, was effective in changing um, the levels of forgiveness that people told us that they felt towards ex-combatants. There was um, about an 18% uh, increase in people's uh, willingness to engage and to live close to ex-combatants, which I think are very exciting results. And we think this... This now gives us a very clear indication of which audio clips should go out and be broadcast. And through our partnership with Dandalkura, a radio station in Northeast Nigeria, and now through our partnership with International Organization for Migration, we will broadcast um, the most effective audio clips in a radio station in Northeast Nigeria. Um, they'll be able to reach millions of people with these messages that we hope will help uh, the reintegration process and in the long term lead to more peaceful outcomes. So in addition to these two trials, we worked with leading academics working in mediation and in conflict resolution to distill the key concepts of their research into easy to use guides that could be applied on the ground in particular with a focus on the context of Northeast Nigeria, but also as a more general approach to mediation and conflict resolution. These dialogue guides were produced in two versions, one for Northeast Nigeria and one more general for the international context. And we, we produced two versions, and then we produced a short postcard-sized guide that could be used on the day-to-day -day of those dialogues and, and conflict resolution sessions. For our final segment of this episode of Inside the Nudge Unit, we're taking a look at some recent work by our Paris team for the Consumer Protection Agency in France. The project focused on tackling the constantly evolving crime of online fraud. Specifically, the team studied online retail scams looking at how the people behind these scams use our behaviour and psychology against us to fool us and defraud us, and what we can do to stop them. To learn more about the work, my colleague Andrew Shine recently spoke with Tom McMinigal, an advisor in our French office who led this project. We are very pleased to welcome Tom McMinigal from our office in Paris to Inside the Nudge Unit. Welcome, Tom. Hi, Andrew. Thanks for having me. Lovely to be here. So you've been working on a really interesting project to help combat online fraud with the Consumer Protection Agency and the Direction Interministériale de la Transformation Publique. So the Interministerial Direction for Public Transformation. The idea here, or the background, as I've understood, is avoiding getting caught by scams is an essential part of everyday life, given that so much of our life is spent online. So your work is relevant to pretty much everyone. I wanted to start with a little bit of background on the project, how it came about and what approach you took. So what did your research find in terms of the types of scams that are out there? 
What are the really nasty and sneaky ones? And what makes them effective at pulling people in? Yeah, so as I'm sure you know, Andrew, there's been a real explosion in the amount and type of scams uh, that we see these days. And a large part of that is due to the fact we do so many things online these days, uh, from our shopping to kind of organizing our social lives, to supporting um, charities and causes, to dating. We do so much online and that's really been a bit of a game changer for scammers because back in the day, um, as a scammer, if I wanted to find a victim, I would have to pick up the phone, I would have to knock on doors or send letters. Now with the internet, um, it's sufficient just to kind of put up a website or create an application and you can let your victims come to you. So there's been you know, this explosion in the amount of amount and type of scams that are out there. This project focuses very specifically on online shopping scams. I think there's two kind of types. So the first type is what I'll call like a, a one-shot scam. So you go on a website, you buy a product, the product never comes or it arrives and it's rubbish. You know, it doesn't meet the quality standards that you it claims on the website. Then there's another type, which I think is probably more nasty in terms of the harm it caused to consumers, which uh, is kind of hidden cost, hidden subscription. So this is often called the subscription trap. And usually it involves you paying for a service or a good. You pay a nominal fee, say, you know, a pound uh, for a kind of subscription to an online um, streaming service. But then little did you know that in the text at the bottom of the page, uh, it turns out you've you've subscribed to some kind of annual fee of, of like £250. So Amazon sort of play on your emotions. They'll get you on things like birthday presents for your kids or charity donations, or they'll target groups that they know are vulnerable, potentially, say, older people or people with uh, with small amounts of savings. Uh, over the last few years, we've seen the, uh, the, the arrival of what's known as dark patterns. These are uh, user interface choices on websites. Classic examples, the countdown timer, which says that the deal is going to expire in a day. The activity message, which tells you that 150 people bought this product in the last 24 hours. The low stock message, which says that if you don't act now, then you're going to lose this deal. And what these do is they play on uh, biases we have, which make us want to act and which make us want to purchase this product because we're going to feel good about getting a good deal. And so both the rise of the internet and in this case, these dark patterns, these the way I design my website to push you towards making a purchase means that scammers have so much more opportunities uh, today to get you with these online shopping scams that we were investigating. Yeah, dark patterns are a really interesting problem. And I think it's one of those areas where there's a gray area too. First, you developed a test where you had a fake website selling fake coffee machines. And the first question I wanted to ask is why coffee machines? Yeah, why coffee machines? Um, so what we did actually, we wanted to identify which uh, product or offer had the highest potential to, in this case, attract participants into our study. We used a social media platform uh, and we launched a series of advertisements where we tested different products to see which ones had the highest potential to drive traffic onto a website. So we kind of launched a dummy website with a, uh, with a URL. We created different advertisements with different products in them and different uh, prices. And then we just saw which one um, had the highest potential to attract consumers. So, Were you surprised that Coffee Machines was the winner? I don't know. I mean, we kind of created a shortlist based on, we looked at popular selling products on Amazon. And it was around the time of, um, of lockdown. And so we were thinking that maybe a domestic kind of product might, might do well. And we know that people love their coffee, don't they? A cup of coffee is more than just the perfect blend. It's about people and their dedication to excellence. Every pour, bringing forth the rich, lively aroma. Every drip, closer to joy. So what did you observe and learn after you kind of found the right product to ensnare people? Yeah, so then we kind of went through this phase of, of like testing, can this intervention actually reach consumers? So can we via a simulation of a scam website, can we actually get consumers to uh, attempt to buy a product and thereby enter into our trial? So this trial was about testing a new way to reduce consumer vulnerability to online shopping scams. So the way we decided to do that was to actually use scammers tactics against them to fight fire with fire. And what I mean by that is we created a simulation of a scam which we promoted online. So we created a fake website which pretended to sell coffee machines and we drove traffic to that site via a social media platform. And when consumers tried to buy the coffee machine, 
they were split into one of three groups. So the first group was the control group. And they were told, thank you for your purchase. We're going to contact you in 30 days to arrange delivery and collect payment. And just to stress, we collected, we didn't take any card details. We didn't take any payments, obviously. Then there's a second group. This one was called the teachable moment. So consumers in this group, they made the purchase. But instead of seeing this thank you for your order screen, they were told you were uh, in the process of being scammed. This is a government initiative to uh, raise awareness about online scams. And here are some links for resources that you can use to try to, you know, bone up on how to be safe online. Then there's the final uh, wing of the project, the final group, which was a teachable moment, but they also had the chance to do an interactive training. So here they would do an interactive training where they would see examples of dark patterns in action, and they would also see websites which may or may not be uh, fraudulent, and they would determine whether they thought they were legitimate or not. Finally, they also had a set of rules of thumb. So this was like really practical things they could do online to make sure that they're safe. So check for reviews on other websites. Ask yourself, you know, is that discount a bit too ridiculous to be true? Check to see if there's a phone number you can ring or someone you can speak to. So then we had these three groups. Now what do we want to know? We want to know whether what we've done actually launching this scam and educating people, telling them, you know, you're in the process of being scammed and here's our interactive training. We want to know whether that can reduce your vulnerability in future. And so to do that, we left a lapse of time. We left a gap of a few weeks. Then we recontacted the same people who'd bought our coffee machine with a new set of fake, fake offers. So in this case, a vinyl player, a flat screen TV and a portable speaker. We observed differences in re-victimization across our three groups. So, for instance, did people in the control group, were they more likely to be scammed than people who had that training or vice versa? And from there, we were able to understand whether this different, let's say, tactic for um, protecting consumers had the potential to reduce vulnerability to online shopping scams. Online shopping fraud is on the rise and criminals are getting more and more skilled in creating seemingly authentic copycat sites. In 2019 alone, consumers lost £58.1 million to online shopping scams. In order to avoid falling victim to online fraud, it's crucial that you know how to recognise a scam website when you see one. Do you have a sense for how prevalent these completely fake websites are? I think they're more prevalent than you imagine, actually. Um, just to go back and give you a bit of retrospect, when we started out, the thing we were looking at was headphones um, and particularly kind of like AirPods because they were the number one selling product, I think, on Amazon. And so I just did a search online through Google, I think, for uh, the kind of comparative, you know, like scam websites where they're pretending to sell these expensive AirPods at like incredibly cheap prices. And sure enough, you can find droves and droves of them. So, you know, this is a huge challenge. Every year in France, just to, just to give you a stat, 800,000 people fall victim um, to scams like this. So they buy a product that is then uh, not delivered or does not meet quality standards or leads to hidden costs. So we know that this is widespread, very widespread. Out of curiosity, on the website that you built, were there signs that it was fake that a really discerning consumer might have noticed? The, the problem is you need to be slightly careful here because what we learned during our research was that the way people assess the legitimacy of a website is often through kind of imperfect criteria, right? So if you go on a website and it looks nice and everything's spelt correctly and there's nice images and there's reviews, you think like, okay, that looks legit, like let's go for it. But actually the sorts of actions that you need to take are um, searching for reviews on Google, like trying to see what other consumers say about it on a website that is not the one you're shopping on. Um, we know, for instance, there's sites like Trustpilot where you can search and find reviews. Um, and then there's other things where you have to kind of sit back and ask yourself questions like, are there contact details? Like, can I, is there someone I can ring if this goes wrong? Like, can I check the address? Does this uh, discount seem too good to be true? So comparing it to prices of the product on other websites. So yeah, I mean, there were some, there were some clues, for instance, the ridiculously low price, the lack of contact details. But nevertheless, in terms of the way the site looked, you know, there were reviews, it looked vaguely professional, there were multiple images of the product. But that alone is not sufficient to keep yourself safe online. And really, if I give one piece of advice, it is go look at what people on other trust aggregators say. So going by the numbers, my understanding is that about 20,000 people clicked on the ad that you put on social media. 6,000 of them put the coffee machine in their basket and 2,500 tried to buy it, which may I just say it's like over 10% conversion. You're doing something right. Well done. 
my understanding is about 29 of the 1,600 people were re-victimized. So you contacted 1,600 of the, um, you know, 20, 2,500 people who had wanted to buy the coffee machine. 29 of them were re-victimized. So it's, it's kind of like very small sample size, hence the lack of statistically significant results. But in terms of the directional effects that you detected, it seems like the training, either the light touch one or the higher dosage training, both seem to be protecting people. I agree with that. And I also think that there are, there's opportunities to um, demonstrate this even sh- more strongly, right? Thank you, Tom. This was really interesting. Tom McMinigal from the Paris office. It was great to have you on Inside the Nudge Unit. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thanks to Tom and Andrew there. Online scams are a particularly cruel and cowardly crime, and I really hope that solutions like these can be tested and scaled to protect people in the future. But for now, that's it for episode 12 of Inside the Nudge Unit. Thanks for listening, and we hope you found it both interesting and insightful. You can find out more about the work of the Behavioural Insights team on our website, bi.team, and our various social media channels. My thanks to all our guests today, Maximilian Cronadale, Dr. Paul Caulcraft, Dr. Antonio Silva, and Tom McMinigal, as well as my co-hosts, Ashlyn Coakley and Andrew Schein. I'm Liz Costa. Inside the Nudge Unit is a production of the Behavioural Insights team. Editing and sound design was by Andy Hetherington of Studio Gibbon, and the producer was Rich O'Brien. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you.